Welcome to Swish, vintage finds for your sassy self. We hope you enjoy the videos and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Welcome everybody. We are so incredibly excited and honored to be at The Way We Wore in LA. And this is Doris. Do you know what? I don't even know your last name. Raymond. Oh yes, I knew that. You would think <laughs> you I would forgot. know that. Doris Raymond at The Way We Wore. So if you've watched any of her shows like LA Frock Stars or your, was that also the same name on YouTube? No, it's just The Way We Wore if you search on, okay. on YouTube. Yeah. So Natasha and I came here to LA for the very first time. And of course, this is our first stop because this is, this is all part of, you know, vintage store history. You're the first person that had a TV show, didn't you? Well, you? There, actually, t t to correct you, uh, Decades also had a TV series that uh, premiered the same week that mine did. Oh. But he was on E! and I was on Smithsonian Channel. Oh. And I prefer the Smithsonian <laughs> Channel. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I ever saw Decades, but it yeah. doesn't matter. We're here. I mean, this well, is great. Was he also from L.A.? Yeah. He, he's got a shop on, on uh, Melrose, and he's kind of iconic, but he's like an impresario. Um, the show that we did with Smithsonian was more of a docu-series, so we didn't um, pan people when they walked out saying, can you believe that person? No, it was all about the history of fashion and also about my business. Right. It's 42 years that I've had the way we wore. 42 years. Yeah. I find that just uh, remarkable. And, <laughs> and yeah. I'm still standing. <laughs> I'm still looking fabulous. Oh, I'm too mean, kind. Yeah, I know this is great. Yeah. So why don't you, 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 you just told us before we started filming that you're from New York originally. I'm from How Long did Island. You end up here? Oh, oh, Long Island? Yeah, it's a long story. I mean, I, I graduated from high school, went to Boston University for one year, was working two jobs, going to school full time, didn't want to continue doing that. So I took a leave of absence, moved to San Juan, Puerto Rico, was a disc jockey and a cocktail waitress, <laughs> met a guy, fell in love, we moved to San Francisco. And he went to the Art Institute, and I went to San Francisco State. And after a year and a half of that, I decided I didn't need to have a degree. Don't listen to me. And, no, it's... and I decided that I could make a living on my own because I had the drive. And um, sold encyclopedias door-to-door -door for wow. two years. I'm the one and only door-to-door -door Doris. You heard it? <laughs> Door to door, door. <laughs> and um, and then uh, in 1981, I opened up the way we wore um, on Union Street in San Francisco. How big was it? Well, the first store was on the third floor, which, believe it or not, I survived for five years. But I had my method, um, and it was probably 650 square feet. And then when I relocated to Fillmore Street, it was probably about 1,200 square feet. Fillmore Street's was, famous. Yeah, yeah, but it was it was. It was a good street then, but it's like really important now. Uh, this store is 3,500 square feet in total. It's an upstairs and a downstairs, but that also includes my office and the storage area. Okay. So I would say all told, it's probably about 2,800 square feet retail. Wow. It's a and lot it of stuff. It is so spectacular. Did you do this gold lame? I inherited it. Wow. wow. I inherited the tufted walls. Um, I'll say that the one area that you see that's come down um, is from um, water damage from the rain last year, and I'm trying to deal with my landlord, so I apologize for the Im Oh, I didn't even know. <laughs> Imperfection. No, I love this tufted wall. Yeah. I had to pay what's called key money when I moved in here to the previous tenant for all the work that they did. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I mentioned to you earlier about an estate I was at where the woman had all that huge collection. She also had the lime green shag. Oh, and then she had the <laughs> green great. and silver metallic wallpaper. Wow. And the mirror on the ceiling in the bathroom and wow. the sunken tub and... Anyways, so, so, um, you know, just like out of a movie, I mean, out of a movie set. So I'm going to ask you a couple of our questions that we always ask. Sure. Um, was your mom fashionable? She was very fashionable. Um, my mom was from Iran and she sold oh, Persian. Both parents. My dad was too. Um, and she knew how to sew beautifully. Her sister was a couturier. Her brother was a fashion designer competing with Rudy Gernreich wow. in the 60s. And uh, mom had a great sense of style that lasted pretty much all of her life. 
Wow. Yeah. And and when did they come here from? Well, that's a long story. My dad immigrated in um, 1944 across the ocean on a ship, of avoiding the Japanese submarines. And um, he sent for my, it was a prearranged marriage. My mom was 12 when he came to the country. And when she was 18, he sent for her. Wow. So by the time I was born, they didn't speak Farsi at home. So I don't speak Farsi. It's one place that I, if I could go freely and, you know, I, I would love to go to Tehran. And, you know, people don't know this, but, you know, in Iran under the Shah, mm -hmm. there were the most women with PhDs per capita. And That's then, right. of course, the Ayatollah put a stop to all of that. And uh, But it was just such a beautiful... It was his wife that was be behind that, oh, Faradiba. Okay. Yeah, it's true. And, and what's interesting is um, I really, and not to compliment myself, but when I see Persian women here, because there's a large population beautiful. here, some of the most beautiful women in the world. Well, that and that makes sense. What I said to you, you look Persian. Stop. No, really, so <laughs> stunning. So anyway, they, the second largest, right? I, I lived in Vancouver for a short period, and outside of Tehran, it goes L.A. Uh -huh. and Vancouver uh -huh. were, are very large communities for Persian. Yeah, yeah. they they call it Tehranjalis. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, so I grew up with fashion, and uh, I used to make my clothes in high school. And then when I went to college, I started thrifting. And this is in the, you know, early 70s when going to a thrift shop, uh, you could buy an amazing, like, 1940s gabardine swing coat for $2, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you work full-time and go to school full-time, $2 is much better than going to Macy's and spending $100. Right. And so the seed was planted, you know, when I was really young. I mean, that was... I think, like you just said, a lot of us, I was a punk rocker, moved out when I was 16, and, you know, it was a necessity that right. you shop secondhand. And Total you, necessity. It yeah. turned into a hobby, and then it turned into a profession. So, I mean, it's like, it's a blessing, because, you know, when you have an interest and a passion for something, and it's you can make a living doing it, it's, it's a real blessing. Yeah. So. Well, you haven't heard this story, because you don't know me, but uh, my grandma was an antique dealer. And I get now that um, I'd go see her and she was 84 at the time or 80 something. And I, she'd say, oh, I found this pedestal table. I've spent 80 years, you know, and you'd go, wow. And then a month later, she'd go, oh, that old thing. Look at this, you know, because it's the high of the fine. <laughs> right, you know, right. I don't get personally and attached to this. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I'm okay to uh, let things go. Is there anything in specifically that you wish you hadn't sold? Oh gosh, no! I, how many hours do you have? Yeah, yeah, a lot. But you know, I at this point in my life, because I'm at getting to the place where I don't need or want to continue working this hard. Um, there are certain things that I'm passionate about, like I collect Mexican silver, I collect uh, brutalist jewelry. These are things that I can we wear, love jewelry and um, it just you know it's a good investment. And um, clothing-wise, I'm not collecting anything per se but except for 20s and 30s LeMay oh. and um, I have a whole room devoted to LeMay uh, where when I'm retired I want to start upcycling um, one-of-a-kind beautiful pieces so we should have you meet there's a fellow in Vancouver um, named Klaus mm -hmm. and he only collects German couture around the war which does wow. not exist and he just showed a a lame dress that is absolutely astonishing and we met him la uh, a year or so ago that's really Anyways, an esoteric a, yes very specific uh, yeah but i god bless him for finding this stuff yeah he yeah. gets some pretty special pieces that's incredible so speaking of pieces i think we should take a little dive into <sighs> uh some of these this piece you know this tell, piece tell is unlabeled this. But we've done the research. It came from um, an auction house in Chicago, and the woman uh, had a lot of pieces by Pierre Cardin. This is Pierre Cardin. It is a book piece. We have um, somewhere, we have the uh, image of it in a book and also um, in the fashion magazine. And um, it's, it's pretty spectacular. I love the fact that it has a hoop on the inside to support the circle. It's just... Amazing. Yeah. 
How do they show it? Do they show it with a little slip or do uh -huh. they just show it? Uh, yeah. yeah, there was a little slip underneath. Yeah. yeah. That is stunning. Yeah. I like pieces that have, um, you know, vintage stores are all so unique because the curation really tells you who the owners are. And um, I personally prefer things that are older than uh, 1980. Um, although nowadays what people are looking for are Y2K and uh, streetwear. So, right. um, you know, the, the handwriting's on the wall, it's time for me to get out of the business. But anyway, so this rack is mostly 1930s and some 20s. We never you, it's ever hard to find 30s or yeah. 20s that's and, intact. And it makes me so sad that people don't pay attention to these things because they're looking for what's trend driven. But, you know, look at this, for example. Um, you think it's just a beautiful kind of um, cap sleeve dress. It's partial bias cut. It's, I would guess it's like 1932 or 33. But what's amazing is all of this work is hand done. Wow, it's like laser cut nowadays. Yeah, but that would have and been by it's, hand. It, you can see, th and the precision with the chain stitch to make that happen. Wow. It's, um, and in Victorian and Edwardian clothing, you see a lot of the embroidery is hand done as well. But I just have a thing for bias cut, 20s and 30s, the fabrics that they used. You know, this is a silk chiffon with metallic threads in it. And Do you have any uh, V&A? I had eight V&A. I sold them to a collector years ago. Wow. So um, V&A was the first one to do bias cut. She was them. an architect of fabric, which, you know, people, John Galliano does a, a lot of really good riffing on using the bias. He's probably the best, I think, in contemporary fashion. Although now that he's with Margiela, he's not utilizing that um, architectural skill as much. Um, I love, um, I don't know what this is doing here. This is a 1940s Hawaiian with a train. Oh, and, is that not Natasha? <laughs> and the 40s rayons, to me, there's a feel to the fabric that today's rayon just doesn't have. No. It's a weight and it's a feel. It's and beautiful. yeah, the Hawaiian pieces, I, I, I just, I love the prints. When I started in 1981 in San Francisco, there was a store up the street from me called Masquerade. And uh, he specialized in Hawaiian shirts and men's like gabardine shirts and things like that. The Japanese were paying like thousands of dollars for like Kamehameha shirts. That market has changed. Like Same with denim. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Certain things yeah. just there's there's a peak. So I used to say that I'm not in the stock market. I'm in the frock market because the the, the value of things. If a designer passes away, um, depending of, of course on the quality of the work that you're looking at. Like I have a, a Gianni Versace dress, but it's not what I would call investment quality. Um, but a lot of things, if you buy from uh, first tier or second tier, can be good investments. Right. And, and again, like you said, it's about the construction of it. I, you know, I mean, there's the cheap and chic, right? That, depending on the collection and everything. Uh, but then there's the Moschino. We both love Moschino. We love the quirkiness. We had a lady in the store the other day that was wearing a suit that she she she's still wearing her stuff from the 80s and it's mm, got wow. the faucets oh the yeah i know that yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 how incredible that she's maintained her figure to be able to wear that she's very petite i've yeah. had so many incredible lifetime mosquito pieces um cruise me baby uh where yeah. there's um a whistle for, for blowing. I mean, just, I love the whimsy aspect of it. And, and you know, Jeremy Scott, who took, um, was the designer for Moschino for many years and has recently stepped down, he continued in the proper vein um, that, that Moschino, Franco Moschino would have loved. I think one of your The Way We Wore uh, episodes was about Jeremy. Jeremy. I saw him last night too oh, at an event. Oh, yeah. lovely. Yeah, because yeah, I remember watching and, and yeah. you, know, you're, you have much broader knowledge than I do and uh, much more learned of specifics. Well, when you have your hands on the material, it really helps. Like we don't get this, we don't get this in, it, in Alberta. It's very, very rare, so it's exciting to see it in real life. Speaking of, there is something around the corner that I have never seen in real life. Oh, the um, 
the gib piece. Oh, okay. So let's take a look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bill Gibb, um, his pieces uh, can be very collectible. I love this one because it's um, so unusual. It's the jacket and it's also the skirt. Oh, I didn't even see So it's skirt. an ensemble and it's in really, really good condition. Although we should take it off this hanger because I see it's making the hanger nipples. But I've, um, I've only ever seen Bill Gibb in earth tones. Uh -huh. So to see something in this pink is also really interesting. This I, uh, I'm so glad you pointed this out because now I know I have to change the hanger. <laughs> it's gorgeous. <laughs> so oh, yeah, gorgeous. Um, and then if, since we're in this area, uh, we have a really nice section of uh, Pucci oh. dresses uh, in the velveteen, cotton velveteen, as well as in the silk jersey, as well as in the silk. And um, his his pieces are really identifiable, although uh, I just bought yesterday a bunch of things that are by Alvarado Bessie. And that person, that woman, uh, I think it's a woman, um, I've never really researched, was in direct competition and did prints that were very, very, in fact, there's a blouse downstairs that's an Alvarado Bessie that almost looks like this. You know, funny you say that because I have a, a client that um, brought me a whole bunch of dresses many years ago. I wish I still had them. But she went to her, her husband at the time, was best friends with the fellow in Como, Italy that had all this silk jersey factory. And she met um, Diane von Furstenberg. Oh, and, cool. And Louis Ferro was doing some of these in the maxi in a similar pattern. And she brought me some Louis oh, Ferro wow. pieces that were you know, sample pieces that had the paperwork and everything. So I think there was, I mean, this is for sure much more identifiable. It was Gucci. the zeitgeist of the yeah. moment, right? Yeah. I mean, you look at... Um, That's beautiful. That's yeah. velvet. It's, wow. Yeah, it's a cotton velvet Gorgeous. jean. Yeah. It's a great uh, mm -hmm. graphic. But That's yeah, so this stunning. is our Pucci. The upstairs um, area is where we keep our special pieces and... Um, it's chronological by period, but also by category. So these are ensembles. Um, and then we have, we start cocktail dresses um, from the 50s. Um, and it wraps around to the other side where we were standing before. I have a, a, a large collection of ethnic material and um, I don't like talking about them because I haven't had time to research where things come from. But I'm drawn to it because of the, um, you feel the spirit in which the people created the embroidery and all the whatever tchotchkes are on the garment. Um, I'm noticing a Moschino Target suit. Did you notice that before? No, I did not. And all, so many of the designers have done, you know, collections with Target or, oh, oh, it's a, ta oh, Target. I thought you meant, yes. The, That's the store. Stunning. Yeah. Look cheap and cheap. Yeah. What's your feeling on those collabs? Like H and M did one with. Um, yeah, I think it's good. They they're they're makes it affordable for young people. Absolutely. Yeah. It it kind of is a democratic way of. Bringing. See, now that's an unusual piece. Wow. I, I love Sonia Raquel. And it's unusual for Raquel. It's not in the best condition, but I thought a designer would want to buy this as inspiration. Wow. So I bought it anyway. I adore Sonia Raquel. Yeah. yeah. I mean, have you ever seen a Raquel like this? No. Nope. Look so, at the back pocket. Yeah. Boy, it's that quirky. is a beautiful piece. Yeah, and then um, as we move down... This is our small Chanel rack, which will be moving because I just bought a bunch of Chanel pieces. Um, it, it's one of the few luxury labels that I, I don't have a problem buying because it transcends time. Right. And people will always look for it. You right. Know? But, um, and then this is kind of an interesting piece. This looks like Fortuny, but it's by... Um, Irish, I believe, a uh, designer named Patricia Lester. Um, she has created a, a method of pleating fabric very similar to Fortuny. Um, her handwork is amazing. Wow. I've never, I've had the straight pleats, but this one has beading that follows the path of the pleats. And this dress has never been worn. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just so many incredible 
incredible pieces. Give me one sec. Sure. Look at that. When I went to Venice for the first time, I saw Fortuny gowns. There, there was a, a there still is this beautiful vintage shop, and they had quite a few. But uh, yeah, I've had. I actually, amazing. I sold. Um, I sold two or three at the Julian's auction a year ago. Uh, they did a whole auction of just my things. It was like almost 400 lots. Um, and that was after the Audrey Hepburn auction, <laughs> which is since I brought that up, um, I sold a dress uh, last year that I bought in a store that sold things that had been um, in films and television. And um, I paid less than $300 for it and researched it because it, it screamed Audrey Hepburn. It was Givenchy Haute Couture label. It was about a size 2-4. It was from the late 50s, early 60s. And it had in the neckline uh, P-A-R, which stood for Paramount, Paramount Lot or um, Costumes. So we researched it. And in less than three hours, we were able to see that it was in Breakfast at Tiffany's. And we computer wow. matched the tweed uh, patterns yeah. to the shoulder area of that item and um, anyway it, it sold it hammered for over $150,000 oh. yeah oh wow yeah what was what was like your react did, did they give you kind of a ballpark you're gonna get that or you just it came oh, they out? low they lowball it always because they don't want to discourage people from bidding and I mean not to look at a gift Givenchy in the mouth, right. um, I was expecting it to go for more because if you research previous, uh, there weren't a lot of pieces in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Of course, the iconic piece, uh, the black gown with the pearls, um, but a pink dress that actually recently re was re-auctioned sold for over 400000 but it had been altered and altered and altered. Mine was exactly the way it was when it was created. Oh, so so, so yes, I had I thought that it was going to be, yeah, but it was not a color. And um, I think black and white, even though it was a black and white tweed, um, was not as appealing. Right. So, but anyway, I'm grateful. Wow. Yeah. That's a great story too. Yeah. What is this beautiful piece here? This is, um, it, it's never been worn. And it, we, I bought this, if I can ever get this out of the hole oh, yeah. in the, there we go. I bought this um, because we do a lot of non-traditional bridal and oh. it's not terribly old. It's 2014. Um, and I make exception for special pieces like this. It's name con. Oh, we have a name con at the store, the silver and uh, v-neck. Um, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. She's from New York. He. Oh, I thought it was a she. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm going to look to see if I'm mistaken. No, I... Forgive me yeah. for correcting you. No, that's okay. Um, I, I could very well be wrong, but yeah, beautiful. And ours is in the same coloration, but nowhere near as dramatic as this one. Wow. Yeah, I, I really, I got a tiger version of this at the same <gasps> time. Um, wow. And yeah, so I, I expect a bride to buy this. That's beautiful. Or somebody who has, you know, the right budget to wear to uh, a flapper party. Do you... Do you get a lot of people asking that? I mean, we get a lot of people saying, I'm looking for a flapper dress for Halloween or right. for part. And you're like, no. I we mean, used to, but we don't anymore. So what other beauties can you? Well, well you know, that's a ridiculous thing for me to say because <laughs> every single thing in here is mm. spectacular. I mean, it's, it's just, I, I, I can't even look at, you know, I'm talking to you and looking over here, but anyways. Is there a piece that you want to show us? The upstairs I have um, favoritism towards because it's what I call the special. But I mean, there's a lot of special pieces downstairs too. Uh, on this side, um, we have uh, jackets and uh, blouses. And you'll see there's from the 30s to probably uh, the early 2000s. Um, one of my particularly favorite things I think I mentioned earlier are the LeMays from the 20s and 30s it's a fabric that you just they can't replicate you know you see mylar and and, and uh, other materials that don't feel this is so soft for yeah. a lame yeah and it's a great 30s little crop jacket but um as we move down um we have 
Um, look at this whole section of just jackets. Beautiful. Special textures. What is this little cute thing? Comme de garçon. Oh. Yeah. I never would have thought that was Comme de garçon, but uh, yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. That's my other weakness as Japanese designers, but... <laughs> And then this wall, which we kind of, we were up against, I mentioned the animal uh, fae. Oh. <gasps> this is the animal version of name con. And, um, but this uh, wall is chronological by period. So we're in the uh, 2000s, the 90s are here, and the 80s are here. And one of the designers that I love from the 80s is um, Fabrice. Uh, he was um, a person of color and sadly passed away from AIDS. He was beloved by Hollywood and um, did a lot of great kind of whimsical or conversational kind of beadwork. Uh, and I've had tons of Fabrice over the years. Um, people love his Beautiful. Things. Yeah. So um, do you have... Uh what would be a uh, uh, fashion trend that you don't like and you wish would just go away? Do you have any of those? Well, extreme shoulder pads. Although, if you've got the right body, you know, like if you're super, super thin, to have that extreme silhouette is, I think, a very strong statement. But for the average person, I think it looks kind of weird. Um, and then I'm not a huge fan of certain types of polyester. Right. I feel that if a person is wearing it, they should have a sign saying caution flammable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mine would be low pants. Ah. Low waist. Like you've pooped in your pants? Well, well oh, low pants. Both of those. Got so it. the ones that are sort of, we call them the kind of gang pants, Got you know, it. where they're wearing their jeans down here. But then also the really low, we had some beautiful... Like um, hip huggers, but lower. Yeah, we had some Balmain jeans in the shop a little while ago. And I mean, the zipper fly on them was only about that <laughs> That's big. That's very funny. And, you know, you, I, put, I put on a pair, and I've never seen Natasha laugh so much because normally there would be a thong. Right. You know, and I right, had right. sort of big briefs. <laughs> <laughs> coming up above the, the low-waisted <laughs> right. jean and I was like no yeah no. And, and I wore low-waisted pants yeah hip huggers of course mm -hmm. yeah but there's a difference between hip huggers and butt cracks yes yeah yeah that's not no yeah that not takes a, pretty a picture. certain <laughs> yeah that's not a yeah. okay not I have to say I agree style. with you yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but you know I think for those people that that are interested in vintage, the, the allure is always that you know the chances of walking down the street and having somebody else wearing what you're wearing are slim to nil, right. number one. Number two, the attention to detail is something that is not affordable these days. So you're getting something that's crafted in a way that people can't put the time and money into. Right. I mean, I'm looking at this. This is a sleeve detail for a cocktail dress. And um, it's Arnold Scazzi, who's an American designer. And um, he did it on the sleeves and he did it on the hem as well. And to, to be able to replicate that today, you know, it costs a lot of money. So you get more bang for your bucks. You can be an individual in the way you dress. Right. And it's good for Mother Earth. So you can't, you can't go wrong. So buy vintage. The one piece that I sold that I still regret selling that I wish I had was uh, it was part of a trousseau that was never worn and it mm. was um, a 1930s baby blue silk bias cut nightgown and then it had the, oh. the robe over top nice. it was French seams by hand it was these baby meticulous little stitches and I sold it for you know next to nothing and there's nobody that could put in that kind of time you no. don't even see that in couture clothes in no. that kind of clothing this was never worn you know she must have got it as a special thing for you know the newly the wedding was called off yeah you never know yeah it was still in the box wow. it was so special that's cool yeah. or corsetry that's hand stitched with the whalebone and you know, you, there's no such thing and right nobody yeah 
Yeah, I, you know, and I tell people if you can travel with a magnifying glass, a loop in your purse, because oftentimes when you go to vintage stores, people mistake machine embroidery to hand embroidery, and you can really tell when you have a loop. Okay. And loops can really get, you know, if something is priced, let's say $65, and you look and you see, oh my God, it's handmade, it amplifies the value right. instantly, right. you know? So, anyway. Agreed. Buy vintage. Buy vintage. Yes. So on that note, thank you for honoring me. Oh, this is such an honor for us, and uh, I can't tell you, um, you know, Good thing we have another half a day to spend here looking <laughs> around. <laughs> There's and a lot to look trying at. Trying things and yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe when you come to okay, you're not going to come to Edmonton. I maybe may. you can hook up with Natasha in Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I have friends. Um, I have a friend in St. Mary's. She used to live in London, mm -hmm. Ontario, and I've been to Alberta and to you've been to Alberta, Lake Louise. I want to oh. go for the stampede. So we're three hours from Calgary. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I like Canada a lot. And depending on what happens with the elections, you may actually see me in Canada permanently. We would, <laughs> we would embrace you yeah, wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, well, thank you. Thanks for having us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.